Greetings and salutations. Today we'll be covering the mysterious murder of Ida Lowry. On the fateful night of April 23rd, 1960, the clock struck 12.30 a.m. At this time, Edwin Smith was making his way home, driving along the dimly lit North Plankton Avenue. Suddenly, piercing the quiet night, he heard an anguish cry for help. Smith would then halt his car his curiosity having been piqued as he hastened towards the source of the distress. The sounds led him to a desolate alleyway in the 400th block nestled between Claiborne and St. Paul Avenue. There amidst the shadow lay 76-year-old Ida Lowry, a figure battered and drenched in her own blood. Stricken with horror, Smith attempted to lift the injured woman only to be met with screams of unbearable pain. Fear coursing through his veins, he raced away, seeking the aid of authorities. Yet despite the swift medical attention reaching her, Ida Lowry succumbed to her injuries in a nearby hospital a mere few hours later. The details surrounding Ida Lowry's tragic demise remained muddled at best. Edwin Smith's accounts paint a rather grim picture, a scene of unimaginable brutality which had been inflicted upon a helpless and unsuspecting victim. The police arrived at the crime scene, summoned by Smith's distress call. Ida Lori, though ravaged by her ordeal, managed to provide investigators with pivotal clues. She recounted the final moments right before her assault, revealing that she had been walking near the alleyway when her assailant seemingly appearing out of thin air attacked her with malicious intent. The mysterious culprit then dragged her into the alleyway, leaving her broken and rather violated form lying on the ground. Despite the excruciating pain, Ida mustered the strength to offer a brief description, a haunting glimpse into the face of her tormentor. She described him as a large white male, emphasizing that he wore that he worked on the bridge. The enigma deepened as Ida emphasized that she possessed no money at the time of the attack, leaving investigators to ponder the motive behind this heinous crime. The murder of Ida Lowry remains an unsolved mystery, haunting the annals of criminal history. Within this tangled web of secrets and unanswered questions may lie the key to unraveling the truth. It must be noted that even with the passage of time, there are those within the city that tremble at the memory of the heinous murder that befell Ida Lowry. Some refer to it as an act so vile it sent permanent shockwaves throughout the community. The victim had been abducted from the very streets she and many others walked, having been forcibly dragged into the depths of an alleyway where her life took a harrowing turn. Her assailant subjected her to a nightmarish ordeal, a brutal adult assault, and a merciless beating. It must be noted that a blunt object would become the instrument used to cause unspeakable amounts of violence to Ida, leaving her broken and violated at death's door in the cold embrace of the dirt, fighting for her last breaths. In her fragile state, Ida Lowry was able to muster the strength to recount the horrific events that had befallen her to the authorities who would seek justice on her behalf. Her words, though few, pierced the veil of silence with a chilling clarity. She described her assailant as a big white man, offering a glimpse into the face of the evil that had shattered her world. Through the haze of pain and trauma, Ida revealed a tantalizing detail. Her assailant works at the bridge. The bridge now would become a nexus of suspicion, casting a shadow over many who would then become connected to the investigation. Ida's recollection provided only fragments of a puzzle that had become the end of her life. She estimated that she lay in the alley, battered and bleeding, for approximately 15 minutes before Edwin Smith stumbled upon her horrific scene. The fleeting moments between the attack and Smith's arrival to her were a mere blink 
in time. Said time held untold secrets, a window into the movements of the perpetrator, and a fleeting opportunity for justice. As Ida drew her last breath, the quest for her killer began. Determined officers descended upon the alley, combing every inch for any elusive clue which might shed light on the unfathomable crime. Yet the alley's silence proved deafening, offering little of substance to guide their investigation beyond Ida's haunting but vague description. The puzzle pieces remained scattered, waiting to be assembled. Each dead end propelled detectives further in into the depths of this enigma, uncovering not only the secrets of her murder, but the mysteries that surrounded Ida Lori herself. As the investigation scoured the area for any trace of evidence, 16 officers combed every nook and cranny, their eyes searching for the elusive murder weapon. A desperate pursuit to identify Ida Lori's assailant ensued, but alas, the shadows concealed their secrets well, leaving officers empty-handed. Even the waters of the nearby Milwaukee River were scoured in the days that followed. However, they offered no solace as the instruments of her demise remained concealed beneath the murky depths. Dr. L. J. Van Heckel, the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner, meticulously carried out the autopsy. Delving into the heart of the grim truth, Ida Lowry's cause of death was revealed to be shock induced by internal injuries inflicted during the brutal and sadistic adult assault. The pathologist's grim examination unveiled a horrifying tale of multiple blows to both her head and body, suggesting that the weapon used might have been a large heavy stick, leaving investigators to grapple with the gruesome image of the merciless attack. In their relentless pursuit of justice, detectives would delve into Ida Lowry's past, hoping to unlock the mystery of her murder. A sorrowful tale would emerge. She was a woman who had known loss, her husband Walter having passed a decade earlier. The void left by her husband's departure cast her adrift, struggling to find purpose in a life now marked by solitude. Once an office assistant in her younger years, she and Walter had lived a seemingly ordinary middle class existence. However, they had been devoid of children, but they were content in each other's company. However, life took a turn for Ida after Walter's passing. By 1960s, she had become a permanent resident of the Hotel Royale, a mere four blocks from the alley which would become the site of her tragic demise. Her appearance had become as enigmatic as her existence, cloaked in odd yet layered garments, mismatched gloves, and a litany of other oddities. She roamed the alleyways, her relentless pursuit of discarded treasures earning her the moniker of rag picker and scavenger. Her unique attire and artistic expressions of her individuality set her apart from the crowd. Despite her peculiar ways, she was regarded as an eccentric yet harmless character by most who knew her. As the layers of Ida's life were peeled back, a haunting portrait emerged of a woman on a ceaseless quest throughout the streets of Milwaukee, forging for discarded clothing, wearing them in a style all her own. Unconventional as it may have been, she had had earned a place in the community's consciousness, her eccentricities seen as a peculiar but non-threatening part of life in the city. The tapestry of Ida Lowry's life had been woven with harmless eccentricity until her untimely fate. The investigation revealed Ida would venture out into the streets at all hours, driven by an insatiable curiosity to explore the discarded remnants of society. As the moon casts an ethereal glow upon the city, she would scour the bins and dumpsters like a modern-day archaeologist, sifting 
through the debris of urban existence. However, despite her unconventional life, the prevailing sentiment in the community remained one of benign acceptance, viewing her as merely an eccentric soul whose harmless idiosyncrasies added a touch of color to the city's tapestry. In the wake of her demise, the city was gripped by a mixture of grief and intrigue. Ida's death had left a hidden side of Milwaukee unveiled, a realm of uncertainty where the bounds between the ordinary and the extraordinary had been blurred. The murder of this peculiar yet captivating woman stood as a chilling reminder that even the seemingly mundane corners of existence could have darkness lurking deep within, waiting to shatter the fragile equilibrium of life. The meticulous search at Ida Lori's abode in Hotel Royale unearthed a trove of seemingly worthless stock certificates, their value reduced to mere scrap paper. Yet it was the discovery of two keys which unlocked a pair of safe deposit boxes in local banks that piqued the interest of investigators. With a dozen detectives now dedicated to the case, the hunt expanded, spanning the breadth of the state, delving into the realm of former mental patients and scrutinizing the records of those previously suspected of heinous sexual crimes. Their relentless pursuit would leave no stone unturned. Eventually, they would find Ida Lori's last remaining ties to the world. These were her two sisters, who unfortunately provided little assistance in unraveling the mystery that enshrouded Ida's life. One sister had been estranged, having lost touch with Ida for months. The other who resided on South 3rd Street revealed that she too had not seen Ida for several weeks. Their accounts offered little insight, reflecting the secretive nature of the woman they knew so little about. It was evident that Ida held her thoughts and innermost struggles close to her heart, shielding them from prying eyes. As the investigation went on, someone within the corridors of the Royale, particularly an elevator operator, emerged as a crucial witness, having been the last to catch a glimpse of Ida before the fateful events of the tragic night claimed her life. According to his recollection, Ida left her room at approximately 10 p.m., a seemingly ordinary occurrence for the woman who had been unbound by the shackles of societal norms. The investigation took an unforeseen twist, casting a pail of perplexity over Ida's existence. Once the authorities were able to acquire the contents of her safety deposit boxes, it became the subject of clear scrutiny. The first box yielded not but emptiness, a void mirroring the same which resided in Ida's life. However, the second box, nestled within the vaults of M&I Bank in West Wisconsin Avenue, revealed a staggering sum of $17,000 in cash. The incongruity between Ida's transient lifestyle, her destitute existence, and her hidden wealth left investigators confounded. How could a woman with such means descend into the shadows and be left scavenging through refuse and struggling to pay a meager $10 rent a week at the Royale. The question echoed through the corridors of the police department. Regardless of how much time was invested into following up on this avenue, the question defied any definitive answers. A mere week after the crime sent shockwaves throughout the city, a glimmer of hope emerged from the depths of uncertainty. A 24-year-old man who had been detained on charges of drunken disorderliness confessed to the police he claimed that he might have been the perpetrator, admitting of his presence in the vicinity during the time of the murder. Haunted by doubts and bouts of alcoholic-induced amnesia, he wrestled with the tormenting notion that he could be responsible for such a heinous act. The shadows of doubt deepened as it was revealed that he had a prior conviction for an attempted adult assault, eerily mirroring the method employed in the assault of Ida Lawrence. However, a glimmer of truth emerged from the abyss of suspicion. The state crime lab, with their meticulous analysis, exonerated the troubled man, eliminating him as a viable suspect. 
Amidst the swirling mist of uncertainty, figures emerged from the shadows. Suspect number one was a compelling person of interest who materialized in the midst of the investigation. He was a large white male once employed on the railway bridge, fitting Ida's description. He was thrust into the spotlight. Due to his proximity to the crime scene, he had been apprehended a few days prior to the heinous act in a state of intoxication. Authorities guided by their pursuit of the truth set their sights on this figure, delving deeper into the labyrinth of his life. Intriguing clues awaited the investigators as they combed the suspect's home. Amongst the discoveries were garments tainted with stains of blood. Their silent testimony beckoning further scrutiny. With bated breath, the items were promptly dispatched to undergo meticulous examinations while the suspect found himself ensnared in the web of the investigation. Proclaiming his innocence with unwavering conviction, the accused vehemently denied any involvement in the vile assault and murder that befell Ida Lowry. He weaved a tale of self-inflicted wounds, a consequence of his drunken binge, which left his flesh scarred. The stage was set for the revelation of truth as the test results arrived, bearing the weight of vindication. The blood that had stained the man's attire failed to align with that of Ida Lowry's, casting doubt upon the suspicions of him being the perpetrator. Now, suspect number two was a figure already in police custody for another transgression. Buried deep within the depths of his criminal history lay a prior conviction of attempted adult assault. A haunting echo from a forgotten moment in time. This was due to an alcohol-induced haze, which shrouded his memory, rendering him oblivious to any misdeeds he could have committed under the influence. Summoned to the interrogation room, the 24-year-old suspect was adrift with merely fragments of recollections. Reluctantly, he confessed that the enigma plagued his mind and it would plague the minds of investigators further still. Locked within the confines of his inebriated stupor, he could neither confirm firm nor deny his involvement in the heinous assault of Ida Lowry. He had gone on to make a chilling admission. In essence, he had no knowledge of whether he could or could not have been the perpetrator. However, this admission was lacking and there was little to tie him to the actual location where Ida's life had been so cruelly extinguished. Yet, in the realm of concrete evidence, this had left the trail cold. The elusiveness of the truth persisted as forensic analysis would go on to clear this individual, showing that they had no ties to the murder of Ida Lowry. With the information gathered, a basic outline of the case can be formed. Prior to the attack, Ida Lowry was a middle-aged woman living what amounted to as a transient life while residing at the Hotel Royale on Michigan Street. Financial struggles plagued her existence, and she had to resort to rummaging through trash cans and dumpsters for survival. Ida's eccentric appearance with mismatched clothing, gloves, and apparel made her a familiar sight to locals. On the fateful night of her murder, Ida Lowry left the hotel at around 10 p.m. The last person to see her alive was an elevator operator at the hotel. It was known that Ida had gone to venture out into the dark streets to rummage around once again, unaware of the danger that was lurking nearby. That night, Ida Lowry was abducted off the street and pulled into an alley, then subjected to a horrifying assault. The assailant was described as a big white man who works at the bridge, brutally violated her, and beat her with a blunt object. The sadistic attack left Ida with severe internal injuries, causing shock and eventually leading to her demise. Approximately 15 minutes after her assault, a passerby would stumble upon the alley where Ida lay battered. The passerby, known as Smith, immediately contacted the police and provided them with the information that he could garner about the attack and Ida's condition. Eventually, two suspects would be discovered. Suspect 1, a large white male who worked on the railway bridge and had been arrested for drunkenness near the crime scene. And Suspect 2, a 24-year-old man with a previous conviction for attempted adult assault, who had been prone to 
alcoholic blackouts. Both suspects would be thoroughly questioned and eventually released due to a complete lack of evidence linking them to the crime. Eventually, the contents of Ida's safety deposit boxes would be revealed. The first box was found to be empty, but the second box, located at M&I Bank, held a staggering amount of cash, over $17,000, which in today's money would be equivalent to around $150,000. This brought up the question as to why Ida was living such a destitute life when she had the financial holdings to significantly improve her situation, if not outright fix it. In summation, the crime scene, a dark alley where Ida's life was so brutally extinguished, would only ever offer fragments of evidence, insufficient to unravel the identity of her assailant or provide any suspects. The shadowy figure responsible for Ida's violation and murder has remained a mystery and it seems that they will remain at large until further notice. Their motives remain hidden and unknowable. The legacy of Ida Lori is now forever entwined with the mystery surrounding her death. If you remained with me until the end, I thank you and I do hope you stay tuned and subscribe for more content.